My name is Kyle Hikonen. I'm a professor at Serada, Center for Educational Research and Academic Development in the Arts here at the University of the Arts Helsinki. Today's uh, Studia Generalia lecture is organized by Serada. It will focus on the employability of musicians. Don Bennett is Distinguished Professor of Higher Education with Curtin University in Australia. With a discipline background in music education and performance, Biola, her research focuses on the development of uh, employability, including identity and graduate work. In her work as a National Senior Australian Learning and Teaching Fellow, Don is uh, uh, operas, uh, operationalizing uh, a metacognitive model for employability with faculty and students in Australia, the UK, Europe and the United States. Please welcome Professor Don Bennett. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, and this is a, a sometimes a very unpopular subject with faculty and mostly an unpopular subject with students who of course come because they want to be artists, they want to be sculptors, they want to be musicians, they want to be composers, not because they want to do a class called career development. So my work's really about how we um, start to think about how we position students to be successful in their graduate lives in a very different way. So I'm going to start by thinking about how do we know what it is that our graduates might need. This is um, Australian data. I've seen data from the UK and from Canada, and I'm sure they would be the same here, that um, here you can see in terms of full-time work, doing a performing arts degree looks like a very bad idea. This is certainly not something you do because you think you're going to make lots of money. And this is what is reported in the press all the time. But is that the real picture? Well, I would argue that even in the existing stats, if we can get hold of the raw data, which is what we did in Australia, we can tell a really different picture. Here are from the same data set, and you never see this in the media, is what happens if we add part-time work to that full-time work. So that means our performing arts students, and we could do the same with visual arts, are working a lot in full-time work and a lot in part-time, which means they're juggling two or more different roles. This will be very familiar for anyone who's done a degree in the arts. What happens then if we put in the work they do when they are employing themselves? Look, very positive. And in fact, we are more employable than some engineers, business students, communication, computer sciences, biology. That's because our work is complex. So one picture we have is these statistics that are created by governance. And if we can get those statistics, the databases, we can start to really see a very different picture to the one that most mums and dads and aspiring students see. The other thing we can do, and what we have to do as well, is to talk to people. So I have a project um, called the uh, Creative Workforce Initiative run from my institution for the last 10 years, where we have worked with graduates across the creative industry, so visual and performing arts, to understand what it is they do, where they do it, how they make their decisions, how those, um, the time they spend in different roles impacts their identity, their well-being, their self-efficacy, all the things that we know to be so important when we're trying to establish and sustain a career. So here's a very small sample. These are um, art graduates. They're, they're visual and performing artists. There were 182 in this study, and we worked with them quite intensively. And this is a bit of a complicated matrix, so I'm going to use some, some color. This group here are the people who are working, all their work is within the arts. Now, that doesn't mean that they spend all their time composing or all their time playing the piano. It means that all their work is within the arts sector. The specialist, the 19 there on your left, are the people who spend their whole time in their specialist disciplines. So they are working as performers. We would see this typically if you were an orchestral musician. 
and did nothing other than being an orchestral musician. I've been an orchestral musician full-time twice, and I have to say my creative life was the things I did that were not in the orchestral role, because that's where I had the autonomy, although I loved the orchestra. Um, then we see the support roles, which are the things that we might do to make performances happen or to make arts exhibitions happen. We might be writing catalogue um, essays. We might be um, creating or convening a catalogue. We might be looking at um, working in, in music repairs or you know, all kinds of copywriting and copy editing work. Then we look at the people who work in the non-arts, in other sectors, and this includes work where arts work is embedded. So this could be um, a violin graduate working as a teacher in the education sector. It could be um, a visual arts graduate working in a hospital, in, in arts therapy settings. So when we look at this, what we can see is a very complicated picture of the way people negotiate their work. And over the years, this made us wonder whether there's a pattern. Is there a trend? Can we say that when you're in early career, in your first five years, for instance, what kinds of things might you expect? Well, kind of. But actually, what we're seeing in the studies that we've done across the career are that we can't really predict what will happen to any one person. So here I'm going to another study where we used... Um, lifespan perspective theory, which is um, a theory that's often used in uh, human resources, in business human resources research. And what we did here was we worked with early career musicians, mid-career musicians, and late career musicians. And what we found was this. In early career, musicians' selection, what they really felt they wanted <coughs> to be doing, was very much performance. And so we use performance because we have to uh, write across disciplines, but in that I would include um, the focus on composition, for instance, or conducting. To optimise their chances of being able to create and sustain work, these musicians in early career broaden their thinking. So they start to think about non-performance roles. And the compensation, and this is important for identity work, is that they're starting to have a much more flexible um, mindset about what is successful and what is not. So that if they're not making their, their living entirely from the creation or performance of art, if they're starting to include other roles, they're starting to think that perhaps that's still a successful outcome. For some people that work is very complicated. And here we see again all the time the awful perception of teaching as a fallback career, and we've seen this from every country. So we all want a performing career, if possible, even going solo. That's why you study music, to play in front of an audience. Becoming a teacher is the worst case scenario. That's for the ones who don't make it. That's the last choice option. Mm -hmm. Now, do we actually perpetuate that ideal in the conservator? They come to us with that that focus, because that's where the passion lies. So one of the things I'm interested in is how we can break down some of those barriers while still <coughs> enabling people to really dream for their ambitions. In mid-career, we see a change. We see that um, people decide what they're going to do according to very changing career and personal goals. Now, sometimes this is reactive because work has not been sufficient. And at other times, people are making proactive um, decisions to say, well, now I've done this, I'd like to do something else. So now I'm going to go and explore maybe something I'd thought about doing earlier and wasn't brave enough to do. And also, of course, personal goals, because at this career stage, people are thinking about, uh, will they ever be able to retire with an income? Um, do they want to buy their own apartment? Are they getting married? Are they having families? Are they wanting, <coughs> excuse me, to travel less? I remember for myself, a, a, a very much a formative moment was I was working in a trio in the UK, piano, viola, clarinet. We were the only trio um, of that combination in the UK and we had fabulous careers, lots of work. And uh, the other two thirds of the trio were married to each other which made life quite easy for them, I have to say. Um, and I was, of course, not married to them and, uh, and also had small children. And then one day we had this fantastic offer to, um, to do one of the big cruise liners for the summer. The pay was fantastic. 
And of course for me, with uh, my daughter was six weeks old when that offer came and I realised that um, now I needed to travel less. And so these decisions can be driven, of course, by personal circumstances as well as by work. So the compensation, whether or not this is a, a, a move that people wanted to make, is that they start to undertake multiple roles, including work in other sectors. And at this point in the career, we do see a trend that people are very happy and willing to keep learning new things. So people are constantly upgrading, updating their skills. And this is the kind of co comment we get from someone who is maybe um, struggling a little because this is someone who's going to audition, scanning the internet, traveling, um, which could possibly lead to some work in the future. All these activities distract from the real work. So the real work for this person is very much still in performance and yet 90% of the time is spent doing the other things. And we see a very um, different mindset in, in well-being we see very different well-being in people who've managed to accommodate all those roles in one identity um, as opposed to the people who have the identity as, in this case, a performer and everything else is seen as something I shouldn't be doing. In late career, we see, of course, um, people trying to extend existing skills rather than use, uh, learn new ones. People who say, I, I know what I'm doing. Um, now I want to extend where I do it. What are the opportunities for me to use these skills elsewhere? And what's quite interesting in the, the um, you can see that this particular study was just music. Um, we saw um, an awful lot of new self-employment in late career. Whereas in other industries we might expect people to have less of that or to feel far more established and stable um, in uh, embodied arts, so I've seen this in dance as well, there's um, in late career a trend to self-employment and amongst the musicians we um, had some uh, traumatic stories from orchestral musicians who realised that their technical skills were not quite what they had been and that there's no other place for them within the orchestral setting and they needed to leave. So what would they do when they left? They became self-employed. So very interesting um, some of the trends we're seeing. Um, but of course it doesn't explain everything and no, we can't predict what happens. One last quote, I love this one. I have all this life experience, I'm motivated and I have a lot to give. Please just trust me and I'll give 100%. Let me do what I'm good at. And that's fabulous. I feel like that. <laughs> I like this late career bit. So for some people, that's, that's how it goes. And of course, some people cope with this kind of environment and others don't. So for me, as a, as a musician and an educator, I'm really interested in how we create the kind of mindset among students that makes them really search for new opportunities and to think broadly about the types of things they might like to be engaged in and who think beyond perhaps expectations of other people in their lives to think what they actually enjoy doing and who are able to manage this process on their own when they're no longer with us. So that's really where my work is now, and that's what we're trying to do. And this is my definition of employability, which we see that a few Australians in the room. It's um, very, it's in the press every day. But to me, it's the ability to find, create, and sustain meaningful work across lengthening working lives and multiple work settings. It's that meaningful work that's really important for me. And I think that's how we actually get our students to think in this way. And it's also how we, we get um, our teachers to think in that way if this is a, a whole new way of working. So I, I said a, a little provocatively, is it our responsibility? Um, I, yes, it is. But it's also the student's responsibility. And I think that some of the things we can do are to move away from the skills debate, the, the, the idea that in higher education we need to equip people with skills towards actually teaching them to think. Because if we can teach our students to think, then they can work out these problems on their own. So that's really where I think it fits in higher education. Students tend not to come to university, especially if they're straight from school, knowing how to reflect. We know how important reflective practice and reflexivity is in our daily practice, so we need to teach them how to reflect. 
And we need to educate the whole person, not just the person with the clarinet, not just the clarinetist, the whole person. And often we don't get to know that whole person, especially if, and I've been um, for many years a visiting professor of viola, uh, and I see people for an hour every week. And we, we're very busy in that hour a week. We don't take much time to really think about the whole person. I do that more now. Um, strong networks. We know that most of the work that's obtained throughout the creative industries is networked forms of employment. Um, there are very good reasons for that. Um, but students then need to know how to network effectively, and they need to know what the environment is. What does it look like outside the university? Am I involved in it already? And how might I use that? And of course, we share our own stories, because then students realise that this employability thing is something we're all engaged with the whole time, and will be uh, engaged with until we stop working, if that ever happens. So um, this is a, a very easy way to start. Um, the term employability um, is a composite word. It has two bits, one to use, to employ, and one that focuses on ability. And with my students, this is an easy thing to incorporate into the next class with any student. Um, let's focus on ability and not employ. Let's pick up that word and think what you're good at. And in the doctoral seminar last week, we, we had a game where we had to think of three things we're good at and write them down. And of course, everyone struggles with that because we focus so much on the things we're not good at, the things we don't feel are strong. And so focusing on the strengths, um, very important. That's a great way of, um, if you have a class, just try that one. It takes 10 minutes and really gets students to think differently. The other thing that I'd like to raise is what success looks like. What are the messages we give to aspiring um, students on um, open day? What are the messages we give on our website? So I had a, a lovely time playing on the university website this morning and pulled out <laughs> pictures that I could find within two clicks, which we know is the, the most people will not go more than two clicks into a website. These were all my two click finds. And so I, I can see um, music, I can see conducting, I can see some animation, I can see some people sitting there, and I know it's about theatre, um, I can see a dancer, I can see a visual artist, there's a keyboard, that's a great picture. I wonder where the teachers are. I couldn't find any images of teaching, and I know the music education programme is a big one here. So sometimes just looking at what, what is visible when people walk into a building and what we put on a prospectus and what is on the website tells us the types of things that students might be thinking when they visit our institutions. If you, it's like being, it's suddenly becoming aware of race or gender. You start to see this everywhere um, and to say, can we just change this a little? So it would be good. We'll see what happens in a year here. <laughs> The other thing um, we can show with students is, um, is how their heroes of the past have done exactly the same thing. There's a myth, I think, that these days work is really different. These days students have to prepare for so much more. And I love to say to students, who's your favourite composer? Great, go and find out how that composer made a living. How did Mozart make a living? Why was it that Beethoven became a freelancer when it was unheard of? What was it that prompted him to do that? And there is the literature to tell us that. Here's um, a cover letter, which is one of the, the things that students think they're going to be forced to do if they do career development. Um, and this is written by Leonardo da Vinci. Now, Leonardo da Vinci, of course, was a polymath. So he was a scientist, he was an architect and... He was fairly good at art as well. Um, so like a lot of our students, as a graduate, he really didn't think there was going to be a job advertisement that, uh, that advertised for his skill set. He had to go out and find work. He had to be um, a portfolio careerist. He had to be freelance. And so he wrote this letter to, um, to the, um, his lordship. And in it, he has nine points. And the first eight of them... Um, are nothing to do with art at all. 
So in the first seven, he realizes that because they were at war at that time, um, there may be use of his skills in wartime. So you can see he's really thinking carefully, how might I be useful? So he says, in times of war, I can strengthen your cannon so that you can fire onto the enemy, even if the enemy is further away. He also thinks that the, the conditions of the soldiers were awful. So he says, I can create um, ways of getting behind the enemy lines by means of bridges and tunnels. He talks about how he can um, work around military strategy, but mostly he works in engineering. Then at point eight of his nine, you can see him thinking, what happens if the war ends? None of those things will be needed anymore. I better just be careful. So he says, in times of peace, I can design cities. I can create clean systems of sewage. And he brings in his architecture. And in the last point, Leonardo da Vinci says, and I can also create sculptures in bronze, and I can paint. It's a lovely cover letter and a great one for students to look at. And I love, just at the end of the letter, he says, and if you doubt any of my abilities, I will be really happy to come and meet with you and demonstrate what I can do. This is exactly what we want students to do, is to think about how they might use the things they're good at, the things they enjoy, in the environment. And that is metacognition, because they have to understand, who am I? Who is everybody else? Where might I fit in? Where is the community that I might be working with? So there's Leonardo da Vinci. Now, how are we going for time? Anyone? Yeah, 20 past 20 five. 20 past, okay. So I'd like to play you a bit of music. And normally I would play this without the words, but recognizing that um, it's being sung in English, I've put up the words. Oh, no. Go back. This is me as a, a Mac user. Oh, well, I'm not going to have it now. We did this earlier and it worked beautifully. Don't you love technology? Yes, it's not. It's normally complicated, but not quite that complicated. <laughs> At first glance, this is a nonsense poem. A nonsense poem meaning that it, it isn't about anything much. It's just a play on words. And I think this is what happens with a lot of higher education. We're so busy, there's so much content for us to get across that we really have to focus on this level. But actually, there's a lot more to this, just as there is in a lot of other studies. This is a, a painting by Chirico who was um, an Italian artist in uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And he was known, the surrealists loved him. But this is his metaphysical stage, as you can see. So what we have here is um, the torso of Aphrodite. Um, and they, probably not how you've imagined Aphrodite, but that's, that's the way he portrayed her. Um, then we have bananas. And bananas don't last very long. So here he's making a comment about the fact that we need to somehow be in the moment and that things don't last. So he's got classical in there. He's got something that's ephemeral. If you look in the very background, you'll see a train. And there he's making a comment about modernity and technology. And any artists in the room will straight away have noticed that the perspective, the shadows, they're all wrong. They're completely out. Even the squares on the, on the floor are out. And there he's making a comment about time and spatiality and place. So actually, this is a really serious painting. And it's called The Uncertainty of a Poet. Now, what happened was, and you can see this, if next time you're in London, go into the Tate Gallery, the Tate Modern, it's, it's there on the wall. It's fabulous. One of um, the leading poets of our time in England is Wendy Cope. And Wendy Cope saw this painting realized the significance of it and wrote a poem where she plays around with words. And what she's doing is talking about the difficulties of communicating. She's talking about how language can be moved and meaning can be moved. So she's also taking a, a, a metaphysical but also a linguistic slant on this painting. 
So what appears to be a nonsense poem <coughs> is not. And I think it's a lovely example, again, to share with students. They don't have to be visual arts students to get this. To say, what else in your learning do you think you could do that with? What looks really simple and you might be able to take apart? So that we're getting them to solve problems and we're getting them to take things apart rather than put things together. So what are we doing? I wanted just to end with um, some of the initiatives that we're working on. Um, and in this particular project, we have 19 institutions. So um, um, University of the Arts is one, and Sydney um, Con is one. Yes, Sydney University is one. So we have two partners in the room, which is great. So we, we have now a model which is based on social cognitive theory. I can send you the details if you like it. Um, but uh, just for now, to point out that we're thinking of how students engage with this thinking from a very structural and theoretical lens because we have to we have to make this sound theoretically sound and so we have six literacies and these literacies encompass the the passion that bring people to a, a field or a profession they um, have the core skills the things that we know students really want to focus on whilst they're studying. They also think about how students are, are working, interacting with other people and how aware are they of the types of work that's done in their, in their discipline. What are the opportunities if you're a pianist or you're a sculptor? What kinds of things might you be involved with? And it doesn't ignore emotional intelligence and um, social uh, literacy, social citizenship, which of course we know are really important. Now, a first-year student isn't going to want to know all this. So what we have to do is to, is to unravel it and give them, if you like, um, the nonsense poem to start with. Something really simple that they can engage with, and then we help them explore it. Um, so I'm just going to really um, give you some snapshots of some of the work we've done. This is with writing majors. Um, they are wanting to be professional and creative writers, and we asked... And um, one of the, the questions people answer when they use our tool is, uh, why did you choose your major? And um, you can see right at the centre there, writing, want, enjoy, stories, professional. This is why they chose their, ma their major. They want to write. One of the other questions is, for how long will you work in your discipline? And there the key word is hopefully. So this is aspirational. It isn't depressing. It's showing us that students are aware of the realities. They are aware of how complex it is out there. And they are actually ready for these conversations. I don't think we need to avoid these conversations without students. They're clever. They know that they need to engage with this. And you can see here, career, find job, long years of working, the future, writing, hopefully. That's really what they're thinking. I create these for every cohort who does the tool, and we use it as a, um, as a prompt for discussion. They, they work really well. Here's some business students, something completely different that just came through yesterday. And you can see in the pink bubble, um, communication. And these students were thinking about what are the characteristics of a successful biz, uh, graduate in business. And you can see communication, teamwork, being sociable, they said, being able to manage. And they have creativity in there, which we're going to explore with them. Then we said, what are the differences, if any, between you and that successful graduate? Letting them determine, determine what success is. And communications there again. So for us, with that group of students, we know what we need to do with them um, for the rest of the semester when they go back to that class is they'll start to, to talk about what, it is, what is it about communication that worries them. At that cohort were almost all international students. They were in Australia. So it could be a language thing, um, but we think it might be more complicated than that. So we can help that group of students, and we can also then start to think about what do the other international students think? Is this something we need to build in every semester? So that's the kind of work we're doing with the tool. So we have this grand proposal here at the university that um, everyone's contributed to over the last three weeks and what we're proposing is that we use the um, self-assessment tool through which our students create a, a personal profile and that gives them something they can work with independently, it gives them agency and actually it forces them to spend a whole 15 to 20 minutes reflecting, which is a good thing, um, even though they don't think it at the time, they, they come to that. 
And then we create um, and provide access to lots of resources so that the, the students who least need our help can go off and do this. They could be really independent. For us, though, as lecturers and for their, as their professors, um, we're thinking that we want to create a, a new semester-long class. And if anyone hasn't seen it, have a look at Stanford University, who um, I wish we thought of this name, um, who have Designing Your Life as an elective. And it's now the single most popular elective at the whole of Stanford. Why? Because it isn't called career development. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Students want to think about their futures and they want to talk about themselves. And we give them one opportunity at Stanford to do that. And they're queuing for that course. Mm -hmm. So we think we could do something similar here, but with a real arts focus. We'd like to establish a program of educational research where we start to understand what happens to students. What are they all thinking in first year? What happens to them in second year? What are they worried about? Is communication an issue? Then we'd like to recruit lecturers to teach into that class, into the um, Create Your Life class. I came up with that in bed last night. I'm not sure that's the title it will have, but we'll stick with that for now. So Create Your Life class, but not just to teach into that, but to take that thinking, that kind of problem finding metacognitive thinking into their other teaching so students are finding this type of thinking throughout their studies and then we want to embed that approach into curriculum the easiest ways to assessment actually but it doesn't mean we're changing the whole curriculum it means that we're changing the pitch it's changing the way in which we approach learning and that will give us a really strong research base for doing something now it's not going to happen by next month but it's uh, this is what we're thinking a good start. So I'm going to stop there because we really wanted to leave time for discussion. Um, the um, web addresses are there and also my email. So if you want any more information, please say. And also if you want a copy of the PowerPoints, um, we can send those to you. Thank you. So questions and feedback and comments. Thank you, Dawn. Are there any questions in the audience? Uh, while you are thinking, I might start with a question. Um, the Innovation Foundation Nesta's recent report claims that in the world of work there is a growing demand for artistic expertise and creativity. And such demand has created uh, hybrid work opportunities for artists. Now, how do you think higher education programs in the arts should upgrade their programs? to ensure that their graduates have appropriate skills and competencies to operate in hybrid realities? And, and where should we focus critically in our current programs? Mm, that's such a good question. Um, yes, and we're seeing this around the world. And it's actually not new, because there were skills gaps identified in business 25 years ago, where businesses were saying, we need people with creativity, and we can't find people who are, we can't find the right people who will fit those roles. We have vacancies we can't fill. So um, this hybrid work reality, which as I've said, is, is there's a myth that it's new and it isn't, um, is I think one of the big opportunities for our students to, to go out and find a place in the world. Um, now, that doesn't mean giving up your ambitions to be a composer or a performer, um, but it might actually give you other opportunities and, and to, uh, an opportunity to find a new niche. To answer your question, students as graduates can't go and find opportunities that they don't know exist. We have to make them aware that Nestor is saying this. We have to make them aware of the types of things graduates are doing that are really exciting. And they, a, a student sees um, one of us, and they see us as a graduate and us here, and they see a straight line. Mm -hmm. They don't see all the circles and the about turns, the U-turns maybe we've done in our careers. So one of the really um, exciting things to show with students is career stories. And I'd love to collect lots of those where people are telling us what they've been doing. So that's part of it, is making them aware and excited about that type of work. Another part goes back to hierarchy and making that um, type of work um, be, in the eyes of students, a very successful outcome. This is something we celebrate at this institution. Um, so that maybe the posters and the website have some other types of images on them. 
And the other thing is, um, to state the obvious, critical thinking. These businesses want people with creativity, and they give them all kinds of other words, like entrepreneurial thinking and enterprise, I've heard a lot here. But essentially what they want is people who can think, people who are critical thinkers, people who can come in to a different setting and bring their creativity. We think about things differently. We, we think laterally, we think outside the box. And it's that type of thinking that business wants. So we maybe have to give our students opportunities to think outside the box and to take risks whilst they're with us. Students, um, graduates tell us that it wasn't until they were graduates and therefore on their own that they realised all this and that they had to take <coughs> risks and they didn't have us to help them. Um, and, and to tell them that failing is okay. Now I'd like to award marks for people who fail at things because then they've tried something different. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And we're not going to do that all next week either. But yeah, it will take some time. Yeah. 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 Dawn, Dawn, can I just yes. ask you a few questions because I'm really inspired by what you've just said. You. And I'm particularly inspired by uh, Leonardo da Vinci's letter. <laughs> because this is something that is close to my heart. I teach the piano in Sydney. I teach teach the piano, what does that mean? Do I teach what I've been taught? And I think with a lot of, of, of instrumental teachers, they teach how they've been taught, mm -hmm. rather than reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a little bit um, unusual in my approach because mm -hmm. I've had a life that is not being straight aiming at trying to beat Sviatoslav uh, Richter yeah. or Horowitz and become another Horowitz. Uh, this it has never been an interest of mine, even though I've loved these pianists. But a lot of my students want to enter these competitions, and they seem to, at a certain stage, realize they'll, they'll never be up at that higher level. Um, and what to do? <laughs> they have to go through a mourning process. Yes. Uh, which they suffer from very badly. Yeah. Um, and what I'd like to see happen at, at institution, and what you, you're already suggesting here, is to bring people in to uh, the institution to tell, the, to tell about their life story, how they've got to that point, that's that squiggly line, because very few people have the direct line to success. Mm. There's an example maybe of Lang Lang who has that success. <laughs> Lang Lang <laughs> yes, has a straight true. dynamic line to being a nobody, to being, some, being a somebody, but most people don't go through that stage. And I think it's very inspiring to, to know that you do this research and that lots of people are on this wavelength. I think it's fantastic. Oh, thank you. And yeah, you're right that, that um, we have a particular challenge with, with many um, studio teachers, instrumental and vocal teachers, who are working one-to-one -one with students. And partly that's because, and I can say this as one of them, we have so little time with students and we have such a, um, a, you know, such a pressure to, to create performance. Um, but there are a lot of teachers who are trying to do things differently. Well, and it's very hard. As a teacher, you go in to teach your, you know, three or ten hours a week. You're not, you're often hourly paid. You're not part of the community, not part of the institution. You don't have an office. You don't have a, um, you know, you're not part of the professional learning. We, we're trying in some institutions to work specifically with communities of practice of teachers to engage them in different thinking. That's not for everyone. Some teachers are not interested. Um, but a lot of teachers actually are. They're interested in thinking about this differently. In terms of the morning situation, uh, well, we're on video, but I have to say, I, I think we have a moral and ethical responsibility um, to position success as far more broad than becoming the next Horowitz, mm -hmm. without detracting from the passion of somebody who wants to be the next Horowitz, mm -hmm. that they can do both. Mm -hmm. um, and they need to think differently. We need to position success differently in the academy. Um, it doesn't work for us to give the statistics to students. There's that awful study done in Hong Kong 
some years ago, probably 20 years ago now, where they worked out statistically you have a 1 in 100,000 chance to make a full-time performance career as a piano graduate. Now that's not going to be helpful for a, an undergraduate <laughs> piano major. It just isn't. We know that. But what is helpful is to think about what are those 100,000 doing? Well, they're doing all kinds of things. Some of them are the people Nesta's talking about, and some of them are inspiring pedagogues, and some of them are doing 10 different jobs at once. That's the important thing. Yeah. Yeah, bravo. bravo. Yeah, well, well done for bringing it up. Thank mm. you. Hi, Dawn. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I know I've spoken to you a bit earlier, and you've brought up the idea of enforced entrepreneurship. Mm. And I wonder if you could just talk a bit more about what you mean by that and the challenges and maybe opportunities that you... That you I just want yeah. to know more about the term. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yeah, it's a dawn term. Um, I, I think entrepreneurship, when, when you think about entrepreneurs, you often um, think Steve Jobs, somewhere like that. Um, and I in many businesses, many sectors, um, somebody becomes an entrepreneur when they have established themselves. So they've, they've worked as he had in business, they've become established, they have a reputation, they have an established network, they also have an idea. And at some stage, they decide to be the entrepreneur. And there's good research about entrepreneurs that they're not actually people who just say, I'm going to do this and do it tomorrow, that they actually do masses of work very quietly in their heads, behind a closed door, and they don't talk to people about it until they're ready. And we don't see that. It's like the, the, you, know, you see the artwork and not the practice of the artist that created that. And so these entrepreneurs um, are the stereotypical entrepreneurs. We think about people who are already established. My notion of enforced entrepreneurship is when uh, um, somebody from the day of graduation has no choice but to be entrepreneurial, enterprising, but to create their own work. They're not just responsible for creating their own work, they're also responsible for their own learning. So they have to access learning, professional learning, um, whether it's about new skills that are just in time skills to create a new role, or whether it's something that's far more strategic and long term. Um, that can often cost. And there's a need here for, um, for us, I think, to work with alumni. Um, I, I've uh, suggested at our institution having an alumni college where alumni can come into the institution and still be part of the learning process um, so that people can <coughs> work out how to work in this environment. So that's what I mean by enforced entrepreneurs is particularly, because this is my interest, people who graduate and from, the, from day one have to be entrepreneurial. Do we prepare them for that? There's a lot of risk taking in entrepreneurship. Thank you. Oh, sorry. No. You go first. Okay, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to read a few quotes from a study we made for the AEC Polyphonia handbook a few years ago, which is very, it's exactly what you are talking about. Um, this is from students from ver various um, second cycle programs yeah. around Europe. Uh, for example, one said, there is not much room for thinking about what might happen after graduation. And somebody said that students live in a bubble when they are at the university. Or that they think more about their arti artistic technical development than their future work. Which means that it's also the question of how we teach them. How we te teach them to to focus on something, they focus on just the play. Mm. And then they also gave some ideas of how to solve this problem, and I read another few quotes. The teacher could ask the students to tell their own understanding or demonstrate it clearly by playing, and encourage them to reflect and present their own ideas. Otherwise, academic graduates do not yet know how to think on their own and they still accept help from the others. Yes, I remember it well. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, this is not new, is it? We, we know this. Uh, as a graduate, I would have said, where were my business skills? 
I don't know how to write an invoice. <laughs> no one taught me that. And yet I need to write an invoice. It's not new. So why haven't we done it? Well, I think because we have some very real challenges. First, students come to us, uh, and this isn't just in the arts, they come to us because they have a passion for something. And the last thing we want to do is to take away from that passion. What we have to do is find ways of them working with, with that passion and creating opportunities that are far more diverse than the ones they're aware of when they come in. They come to us in music especially with very performance focused ideas because that's what the training up until the uh, uh, um, university education, that's what it is. It's performance based and that's where the passion is. So I think first of all we have that, that pressure. Secondly we have narrow de definitions of success and we don't really talk about the other ways of being successful enough with students. And yes, sharing story is fantastic. Um, third, we have a curriculum. Someone said moving a school of music is worse than moving a, harder than moving a graveyard. Um, and you know, I think moving a curriculum can be can feel like that. This institution has moved its curriculum. But I'd also say if there's a curriculum that can't be moved, a curriculum is a framework. That's what it is. It's what we do with it that makes the difference. So we need a kind of cultural shift. And whilst we won't get everyone on board, I think there's, there is enough interest in an institution for us to have a critical mass that touches every student. And we can do it within curriculum. As for the time issue, well, I just think we have to do things differently. We don't have to do things more. I, I, there's a trend in the UK and Australia to, to now create separate streams of study called something like um, career development or, or work ready skills. And students hate it. Mm -hmm. They hate it because of the language. And they hate it because it takes away from what they're there at the university to do. Mm -hmm. So if we took that time and instead of calling it career skills, actually looked at let's look at all the great entrepreneurial artists out there, let's look at what Nesta's looking for, let's explore and take some risks, um, then students like it. It doesn't take any more time. Yeah, I know. AEC does great work and there have been so many moves in, in, in music. I, I know music better than the other arts um, and yet we still have the same comments from graduates so we obviously need to do more. Yeah, thank you very much Dawn and get, get a deeper idea of, the, of this and what um, I was thinking about today especially was have you do you have a sense if this program has enabled students to kind of connect with each other and the reason I'm asking this is because um, again in the arts it, it can be a very lonely <laughs> it can be a lonely thing mm -hmm. to, you think you need to make it on your own and you need to find your niche and you as one person blah, blah, blah. so um i can just see great potential in people coming up with new approaches together mm -hmm. in in pairs mm -hmm. or in tiny groups and and so forth in their careers absolutely because practice doesn't happen in isolation does it you know when we're working as artists when we, it's the social side of of music making and, and, and dance and theatre, that that's what brings us into it. It's very few people really want to work on their own. Um, we like to work with other people. Um, so do we create opportunities? Yes, uh, of course. And if we have something like um, uh, a programme where students can work within community, for instance, then instead of them just being all the music students doing that, we have um, a music student working with a visual arts student, working with a theatre student, working with a student from biology, if there is one. Um, and, we, and we have them work in teams because that's how it works in the real world. They love it. They learn so much mm. from one another, just as we do when we work with teams. So yes, and actually that can be a way of creating good space within the curriculum. If we have projects that are um, meeting one aim, that is an aim we need to have met, you know, because it's in the learning outcome. Um, but we do it in a in a really innovative way. Um, that can create space for students to explore. 
So that might be working with um, with um, different communities of, of people. It might be working work, working in a different sector. It might be going to a law firm um, that is saying they want um, some creative thinking. And students are amazed that they can do that work. They can't believe that they can do that work. And then they realise how much people charge for that work and they get really <laughs> interested. <laughs> These are all great ideas. Yes. Thanks Tom, for a great talk. Um, I am thinking about this uh, first slide or second slide, the 38 people working in the arts and something else mm -hmm. versus the 19 working just in the arts. And I was wondering if you could uh, explain a little more if you have found any differences in their psychological and physical well-being. And in connection to this question in your program, do you help them with those issues? Um, the short answer to your first question is, is no. Uh, because, so the question is, is there, is there a difference in psychological well-being between someone working only in the arts and someone who works in uh, arts and non-arts settings? And physical. Um, yes, yep. and the physical, so the embodied work, yeah. I think, to me, um, we could have the same person and um, if we could clone them so they were doing um, exactly the same work in the same setting um, the difference between well-being would be that one person has decided that this work is part of their identity as an artist and that they are satisfied with this work now now that might not mean that they want to be doing that work forever. I'm not sure any of us are ever in the position where we want to be doing exactly the same thing forever. Um, but if that person has identified as, this is, this is my, I think of a musician as an umbrella term, and it's not a performer. A performer is a performer. And that's one thing that goes under the umbrella. Another thing is, is a composer. So people who say to me, yes, but a performer is a musician. A musician is a performer. So what about composers? What about conductors? Are they not musicians? Oh, well, yes, they are as well. Well, they may not perform. So I think there's a lot of things like teaching um, uh, that goes underneath that umbrella. So the person who tends to have psychological well-being and will actually answer, identify with less words, which is really interesting when we ask them, how do you identify as an artist? Um, are the people who put everything under an umbrella that they've created. And the people who are feeling angst and, and don't have good emotional well-being are the people for whom their work is not part of their identity. So there is, there is bits of work here that they just feel uh, is a failure. And going back to your comment about the pianist, that process of mourning, deep mourning, because it's a, an enforced transition from their aspirations and they don't know where else to go. I have a real problem with that. I really want students to know where else to go when they're still with us. Can, can I just ask, link into this, because I think uh, the business with pianists is particularly tragic because they do want to work on their own. Yeah. A pianist who, who wants to play with two or three other pianists uh, is not really looked up towards as being a real artist because yeah. they have a collaborative piano, they yeah, very yeah. nice. <laughs> but but it, and, and it's let's face it, Gerald Moore made, a, made an incredible career out of it, and Jeffrey Parsons, all these people. Mm. But what uh, uh, what I think what I think is uh, is uh, so so tragic with pia pianists is that they they live an inch of a life, mm. and this and their teachers have lived an inch of a life, and so the whole thing goes on. And I think we've really got to get into the. Mm. In, into the bottom of all this and make them realize already very early on in their life that, uh, that playing, the, playing the piano does not necessarily mean that only you have to play solo. You can also accompany choirs, yes. you can accompany ballet, you can accompany uh, singers and all that sort of thing. And, and that would enrich that framework. For the pianist, but, uh, but I think it, it, yeah. it, there's such a hierarchy there, it, isn't there, in, in <coughs> piano? And uh, I love hearing interviews of, of you know, stellar international pianists who say, 
the, the joy in my life is work is when we do ensemble work. I adore it. I love it. I love playing in that quintet. I love playing those duo recitals. That's changed as well. Yeah. well I'm not that old, but I remember very much in, in my early recitals, it was always me mm. with an accompanist. Mm. No, you wouldn't do that now. Now they're duo recitals. The pianist always has more notes than me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully that's got everyone thinking. Thank you. And I think we're just about on six o'clock. Just about. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.